Thank you, Dr. Kabaz. It's a pleasure to join everyone, if only virtually, for the start of Vector Week 2022. I understand you will be discussing some pretty ambitious goals for reducing illness and death and talking about how you will work to address vector-borne diseases in a whole new way. And this is a very exciting time. It seems almost a lifetime ago that I was introduced to vector-borne diseases. I vividly recall my first exposure to a case of Ehrlichia in the mid-90s as an intern in Baltimore. There was a young woman, a marathon runner, who was encephalopathic and incapacitated in the ICU with liver function abnormalities, low platelets, and an unknown diagnosis. Without a standard laboratory test for Ehrlichia at hand, we went to the research labs in search of a diagnosis and ultimately got one. By the time I started my infectious disease training in Boston, I had seen that one case of Ehrlichia and had a handful of cases of Lyme, but I was soon to be introduced to an enormity of Lyme disease each summer, generally June through September. As our climate changed, Lyme disease gradually became something a Boston doctor had to deal with year round, along with Babesia, Anaplasma, and Tularemia. Indeed, we sometimes say vector-borne diseases have become the bread and butter of infectious disease practice in Massachusetts. And we would not infrequently see Lyme, Anaplasma, and Babesia in the same patient. The impact of climate and weather and health on vector-borne diseases is tremendous, with ticks and tick-borne diseases spreading into new geographic regions. For example, West Nile virus first appeared in New York in 1999, and in five years, it had marched across to California. Now, West Nile virus is the leading cause of mosquito-borne illness in the United States. In 2021, the West Nile virus outbreak in Maricopa County, Arizona, was the largest local outbreak since the virus was first detected in 1999. Last summer's outbreak was responsible for almost twice the number of West Nile virus neuroinvasive disease cases than the next largest localized outbreak in the United States. In 2019, Nebraska state health officials identified established populations of the black-legged tick in several counties. And in 2021, the first cases of locally acquired Lyme disease were reported there. Mild winters, fewer days of frost, early springs, and warmer temperatures all giving mosquitoes and ticks more time to reproduce, to expand their habitats throughout the United States, and to spread diseases. The geographic and seasonal distribution of mosquitoes and ticks and the pathogens they can transmit depend not only on climate, but also on land use, socioeconomic and cultural factors, pest control, access to health care, and human responses to disease risk, among other factors. As with all health crises, everyone is not equally at risk. We have seen that after extreme weather events, socioeconomically disadvantaged and marginalized populations sustain disproportionate harm and loss, making this an issue of health equity. Certain tribal communities in Arizona are disproportionately impacted by Rocky Mountain spotted fever. In fact, the three most highly impacted tribal communities in Arizona have incidence rates of spotted fever rickettsiosis, including Rocky Mountain spotted fever, 150 times higher than the national average. More than 500 cases, including 28 deaths, have been reported between 2003 and 2021. Since 2018, CDC has dramatically increased its efforts to support capacity building for tribal communities through extramural funds to purchase equipment and cha train staff in vector control and animal control, and to adapt Rocky Mountain spotted fever prevention activities based on local needs and resources. Working together with tribal communities, our goal is to reduce Rocky Mountain spotted fever infections on Arizona tribal lands to less than 10 per year by 2024. This work is possible through a strong collaboration with tribal, state, federal, and nonprofit partners, including CDC Foundation and PetSmart Charities. 
Entomologists play an important role in characterizing vector-borne disease risks within communities and in developing and implementing prevention programs along with state and local health departments. However, the field currently lacks diversity, and recently the National Science Foundation found just over 2% of graduate students in entomology and parasitology are black, and just under 5% are Latino or Hispanic. This lack of diversity limits the ability of the field to address issues of racial and cultural barriers. Recognizing that entomologists have an important role in addressing racial and cultural barriers, CDC and the Entomological Society of America partnered to establish the Public Health Entomology for All Fellowship, a five-year program to expand the diversity of those working in public health entomology. Passage of the K. Hagan Tick Act in December 2019, named in honor of Senator K. Hagan, who passed away in October 2019 from complications of the tick-borne Powassan virus, was a major milestone in supporting research and program activities for the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of vector-borne diseases, and tick-borne diseases in particular. The Act authorized increased support for CDC's Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Cooperative Agreement, or ELC, of which many of you are recipients. In 2021, ELC awarded approximately $16 million to 63 recipients to continue work on vector-borne diseases in health departments around the United States. The Act provided ongoing support for the university-based Vector-Borne Disease Centers of Excellence program, originally established in 2017 with Zika supplemental funding. Since 2017, those of you in the Center of Excellence have trained over 5,300 vector control professionals and students, developed undergraduate and graduate degree programs or certificates in public health entomology at all five centers, spearheaded creation of regional vector surveillance systems for centralized data tracking, evaluated effectiveness of innovative mosquito and tick control methods, provided resources and technical assistance to local organizations, and contributed more than 230 vector-borne disease-related publications to the literature. The Act also directed HHS to continue development of a national strategy for vector-borne disease prevention and control in humans, an extension of the National Framework for the Prevention and Control of Vector-Borne Diseases in Humans. Development of the original framework has led was led by CDC in collaboration with Departments of Defense and of the Interior, USDA, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Through the Act, work to develop a full national strategy was authorized to be completed in 2023, and federal participation has expanded to involve six federal departments and 17 agencies. I look forward to reviewing and supporting the implementation of this important cross-departmental plan. I'm excited to be learning about vector-borne disease advances on the horizon. Until just last year, no vaccines were available to prevent vector-borne diseases in the United States. On June 24, 2021, ACIP voted unanimously to recommend the first FDA-approved dengue vaccine, Dengvaxia, for children 9 to 16 years old who have laboratory-confirmed previous dengue virus infection and are living in dengue endemic areas. The United States territories of American Samoa, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and freely associated states, including the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. Dengvaxia works against all four types of dengue virus and protects people from hospitalizations and severe dengue. Our Division of Vector-Borne Diseases is currently working hand-in-hand -hand with the Puerto Rico Department of Health to develop and implement a dengue vaccine program projected to prevent thousands of dengue-related pediatric hospitalizations. A second dengue vaccine candidate originally developed by staff in the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases is in Phase three clinical trials. And in the coming years, several additional arboviral disease vaccine candidates in various stages of development may offer us a greater opportunity to decrease morbidity and mortality from diseases including Lyme, dengue, West Nile, chikungunya, and Zika. 
An estimated 476,000 people are diagnosed with and treated for Lyme disease in the United States each year. A new vaccine against Lyme disease is being evaluated for those ages five and up and is now undergoing phase two clinical trials in Europe and the United States with availability projected for 2025. To prepare for this new vaccine, CDC is conducting research on disease burden, vaccine acceptability, and public health and economic impact. This Lyme disease vaccine is especially important as we see Lyme disease diagnoses in new geographic areas. Just as new vaccines offer us hope for controlling vector-borne diseases, so do advances in mosquito control. More than 75 years ago, CDC was established as the Agency for Malaria Control in War Areas, created to keep the southeastern states malaria-free during World War II. Mosquitoes are still a scourge across the nation, but now new non-insecticide sterile insect techniques, such as mosquitoes with Wolbachia, genetically modified mosquitoes, and irradiated mosquitoes, use promising new technologies for our mosquito-borne disease prevention and control toolbox. Since January 2021, we have worked closely with partners in Puerto Rico to develop strong community support to release mosquitoes with Wolbachia in four neighborhoods. As a result, the mosquito population there has been reduced by 50%. CDC is monitoring the impact this technology will have on dengue transmission. We're also working with other states, other countries, and international partners on the feasibility of implementing and assessing the impact of these non-insecticide sterile insect techniques on local arboviral disease transmission. As I said, this is an exciting time to be working in this field. Envisioning a future where vector-borne diseases no longer threaten public health. Despite the challenges of balancing public health priorities during the pandemic, significant progress positions us well to advance our public health protection goals in the coming years. I look forward to hearing all you will accomplish.